Suricata provides an easy installation path using pre-built binaries for several popular operating systems. But what do you do after you've installed Suricata? In this video, we'll explore Suricata's configuration file and identify essential elements to get your network monitoring up and running. Finding these videos helpful, please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. Comments are open as well, so let us know what you think. Let's get started. The default location for Suricata's configuration file is in etsy suricata suricata.yaml, and by the file extension you can tell that it is a YAML file. To edit this file, we do need to have administrative permissions, but I don't plan on doing that in this video. We can open this file using whatever text editor you prefer. I'm going to go ahead and use nano. Now when opening this configuration file, there are a lot of options, and it's very easy to not only get a little overwhelmed, but also to make very profound changes to how Suricata performs. So you do want to be careful, and I would suggest creating a backup of this file, particularly if you plan on making any changes. The configuration file also provides different steps. As you can see here, we have step one, which is to inform Suricata about your network. You can generally find these different steps to understand how you might need to make modifications to your Suricata installation to customize it for your network. In this video, we're just going to touch on some of the more important configuration elements. So under step one, we have the VARS section. These variables are relevant to the rule engine, and you'll see these variables used throughout rule syntax and the different rule sets that you're utilizing. The first group is the address groups, and this contains the home net and external net variables. Home net is very important because it defines the home net, the IP ranges that you're going to want to monitor or consider the internal part of your network. The default values here are RFC 1918 addresses, but you want to make sure that this matches the internal IP ranges that you're using. Otherwise, you'll have problems with detections when it comes to the alerts. External net is just the negation of home net. From there, you'll see lesser used variables, such as HTTP servers, SMTP servers, SQL servers. These can be used in rule syntax, but by default, they're just going to simply be the home net variable. Continuing to explore this file, we can scroll down to the next step, step two, selecting outputs to enable. A couple of things I want to point out here. First is the default log directory, var log suricata. This is where you'll find the eve.json file. That's the default location for all of the data that Suricata is logging. This file is a JSON formatted file that can be consumed by other pipelines, such as a SIM, in order to process the data that Suricata has generated. This not only includes alert data, but also all of the other data that Suricata is generating, such as application logs and flow data. This file really becomes a treasure trove of information. Next, you have the global stats configuration section. I just want to point out that by default, stats are enabled. This means that by default, Suricata will be generating this information in that eve.json file. If you're not interested in stats, this is something that you could consider disabling by simply changing enabled yes to enabled no, saving the configuration, and then restarting Suricata if it's running. Scrolling a little further down takes us to the output section. This further controls the data that Suricata is generating. We have a section for fast, which produces a fast.log file, sort of a legacy artifact that is going to be a line-based alerts log, similar to something that Snort does. We have a section for eve-log, and this is where you can control the actual format of the eve.json file, as well as the name of this file. You'll see that by default, it is enabled, the file type is regular, with some additional options provided as a comment, and our default file name, eve.json. Scrolling down a little further, you can see that there's also the ability to produce the community ID. Now, this is a value that is disabled by default, but is a really important property because this community ID that Suricata can generate is how you can integrate and correlate log data between Suricata and other tools. Other popular projects such as Archimy, Zeek, Wireshark, and Elasticsearch also produce community IDs. Community ID would allow you to quickly pivot between these data sets, that is, going between Suricata data and another project that also generates a community ID. Suricata provides great documentation about this feature, so check it out if you're interested. There isn't much that you have to do in order to get community ID support in Suricata. Continuing to move down this file, Suricata produces event records as its primary format or structure in the eve.json file. 
in the Types section, we can continue to refine the type of data that Suricata is generating. For example, it's often desirable to have log data with very popular application layer protocols, such as HTTP or DNS. Not only does this tell you the type of information that Suricata is generating, these sections can allow you to modify the data that Suricata produces for each relevant data type. For example, by default, we have extended logging from HTTP. There's also opportunities like custom fields that allow you to record certain HTTP headers or tell Suricata to log all of the HTTP headers with each request or response. Getting deeper into the configuration file, you'll also see a section for PCAP logging. Suricata does provide full packet capture. This means that Suricata can provide a full record of the network traffic that is passing through it. This capability, though, isn't enabled by default. The last section I want to point out is called File Store. Suricata has a couple of very important capabilities when it comes to files. Not only can it detect file types and create file records while it's inspecting network traffic on the fly, it can also perform file extraction in real time. This means that you can get information about a file, such as this hash or file type, as well as carve out the file and then hand it off to maybe another processing pipeline to help automate some of your analysis. This finally brings us to step three. And this is a configuration item that we changed in an earlier video when we set Suricata up. In case you missed that video though, the interface under AF Packet has to match up with the interface name on the system that it's running. If it doesn't, it's not gonna be able to understand what interface to use in order to monitor traffic. The last step in the configuration file is step four, the app layer protocol configuration. This is where you configure app layer parsers. Suricata provides many application layer protocol parsers, which provides you those rich log files beyond just basic flow information. This section not only shows you what protocol Suricata supports, but also allows you to enable, disable, and do some customization or configuration. This is another one of those sections though. If you're not really sure what's going on in here, it's best to just take a look to see what's available and then not make any configuration changes until you have a specific reason. So as you can see, the configuration file can be a bit daunting, but when we look at it in its organized components and understand, and understand the sections and their relevance to how Suricata operates, it can make it a little bit easier to tackle this file. Getting started though doesn't require a lot. There's some basic configurations, such as the home net variable and the network interface that Suricata is capturing on that allows you to get up and running rather quickly. This just scratches the surface though, so stay tuned, as we'll continue to explore how you can leverage Suricata in your networks.